Turn your Bibles tonight, if you will, to the book of 1 Timothy. The book of 1 Timothy, we're talking about the names of Jesus on Wednesday night. We've been looking at several different names, and we will look at another name tonight. While you're finding your place and getting ready to stand, I ask you to remember me in prayer. Uh, this coming Friday morning at 10 o'clock, I'm participating in the recruit graduation for the Winston-Salem Police Department downtown, and uh, ask you to pray about that if you would. And then somewhere tonight in the message, I haven't figured out just where, I've got to say something about Duke. Brother Griffin came out Sunday night and handed me a dollar bill to put in the church for what I said about Duke Sunday morning. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to have to, somewhere tonight, I've, we've got to get this building paid off this year. So there's the source. All I've got to do is say something about it. In fact, I've probably done said enough to get another dollar tonight. But uh, uh, he's, a, he's a mess. He come out, he said, I'm going to give you this dollar for what you said about Duke this morning. All right, 1 Timothy chapter number 6, and begin reading in verse number 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, and Lord of Lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. In verse number 15 tonight, I want to talk to us a little while about this particular name that's given the Lord Jesus, where the Bible says, King of Kings. Our Savior is called the King of Kings. And uh, I want us to kind of think about that for a little while tonight. Lord, thank you that we're, gr we're grateful for who you are, and we're grateful that all power resides in you, our Savior, and that it is available to us, the body of Christ, the church of the firstborn. So help us this evening during these moments again to be challenged from your word. And we'll thank you, Lord, for all you do for us and all you do to help us. Because we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. Someone has done a lot of research and they have detected that since man was created and placed on this earth, that there has been descendants from Adam and Eve down to the present hour in the accumulative number of about 60 billion people. 60 billion people have walked on this earth. Of those 60 billion people who've walked on planet earth, only a handful of those people have made any real and lasting impression and brought about a change in this world. But in that handful of people, just a handful compared to the amount of people that's walked on this earth. In that handful of people, there is a person, there is one person who stands head and shoulders above all of the others, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. More attention has been given to him, more devotion has been given to him, and more criticism has been given to him, and more adoration has been given to him, and more opposition has been given to this one person 
than all of the other people put together. Jesus is unique. To explain the Lord Jesus Christ is an utter impossibility. There's not enough words in any language of the world if we took all of the languages and put them all together. There's not enough words in any of the dialects of this world to really adequately explain the uniqueness of the Lord Jesus Christ. To explain him is impossible but to ignore him is disastrous. The Bible is true that if we reject the Lord Jesus Christ, that is a fatal rejection. To know the Lord Jesus Christ is to love him. And I'll say that again. To know him is to love him. And to love him is to trust him. And to trust him is to be radically and dramatically and eternally changed. Think about the book you picked up tonight to sing out of. Think about all of those songs uh, in that hymn book. And that hymn book is just one hymn book of tens of thousands of hymn books, different types of hymn books that authors have set down and they have wrote hymns about him. Uh, there's no way tonight, there is absolutely no way tonight that we have any way of knowing how many tens of thousands of songs have been put together on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no way tonight to know how many books have been written, uh, how many libraries contain volumes and volumes and volumes, how many studies contain volumes and volumes and volumes of books about the Lord Jesus Christ. Hospitals have been started and rest homes and ministries have been started in that name. It's very obvious that as you go out into the world and you look at the jewelry that people wear, you find many people uh, wearing a cross around their neck or they'll have some type of emblem of the cross or something on their car or in their car to remind others about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have churches by the tens of thousands, especially here in the United States of America with their steeples pointing towards heaven, <coughs> reminding us that there has been one who came across the landscape of this world <coughs> who has made all of the difference in time and in eternity. No one has ever, ever affected the human race and affected the world like the Lord Jesus Christ. Take like all of the other religious leaders of the world, all of the accolades, take all of their expressions, uh, take all of their teachings and all of their writings uh, and put it all together in an accumulative form uh, and it would not be nothing compared to all of the information that's been composed and written and all of the buildings that have been built and all of the pluses that have been placed in this world as a result of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has literally changed the course of the world. Now one reason that's so is because, and I know I'm preaching to the choir when I make the next statement. One reason that's so is because of who he is. He's not an ordinary religious leader. He's not an ordinary teacher. Uh, he's not one that just basically set an example for us to follow. Uh, he was and he is the Son of God, but even beyond that, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is a king. We find that tonight in our text. If you'll notice again, the Bible teaches us some things here about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in verse number 14, uh, the Apostle Paul writing to young Timothy, a young minister of the gospel, in verse 14 says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukably, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice the word, if you will, the word appearing. That is a word uh, that we see in some of the other mainline denominations. There's a church here on Silas Creek Parkway 
uh, out near Renona Road. On the, re on the left, I see the sign occasionally, the Church of the Epiphany. Now that word there, which is called uh, the word appearing, is the word that we get, see associated with churches across the landscape, the word epiphany. It's a word that literally means a glorious manifestation. Now Paul is saying to Timothy, I want you to understand uh, that there is going to be a glorious manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, now when he said that, and he got to thinking about that, as he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, he kind of gets caught up in that. He kind of gets carried away in that. Well, for instance, like he did in the first chapter. Turn back there just a moment. Paul never, listen, hey, neither should we. Paul never could get over the fact that God would love him enough to save him. He never got over that. Now, I've met some Baptists that's got over it. Uh, they've, uh, they got out in some kind of a spiritual desert somewhere or they stuck their spiritual fingers in an electrical conduit and they got shorted out. But the truth of the matter is, those of us who are saved this evening, uh, if we're in fellowship with him, we have never got over it. By the way, who wants to get over it? I mean, it's so good, so wonderful, so enjoyable to know if nothing else, if there was, look, if there was nothing else, just the peace of knowing that we have our sins forgiven and just the peace of knowing that our destiny and our destination has already been established, it's already a settled issue, uh, and we can walk through this world uh, knowing those two things, that the one thing that would keep us from our destiny is our sins. That's been taken care of if we're saved. And now we know where we're headed. We're not going to uh, take a leap in the dark. We're not going uh, to go out in limbo or in a state of non-existence. We know to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. Look, there's nothing in this world that can give us the peace to know that we're not taking a leap into the dark. We know, we know what our future holds. I, I, there's multitudes of people that's living their life every day and they don't know. They look at the future with darkness. They look at the future with bleakness. They look at the future with a question mark. Uh, they have no hope. In some of the third world countries, all of their music's in the minor key because they don't have music that will uh, flood their soul with joy that there's a mansion over the hilltop. They don't have the old rugged cross that stood on a hill far away. Uh, they don't know what it is to have a daily uh, walk in communion and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know what it is uh, to come before the throne of grace. They don't know what it is to have a propitiation for our sins. They don't know what it is to have an advocate. They don't know what it means uh, to be saved and to have the joy that passes all understanding. Even on the worst day of our life when everything seems to be going wrong and going in the wrong direction and caving in on us, there is still down in the dormitories of our soul uh, a peace that this world never gave us uh, and it can't take it away. Uh, I'm grateful this evening for the privilege uh, of knowing him and being on his team, being a part of his church uh, and knowing about the benefits of being saved. Multitudes of people don't know that. They don't have that experience. Uh, they don't have that excitement. They don't have that expectation. But Paul uh, was so enraptured over the fact that he'd been saved, uh, he just stopped and shouted a little while. Uh, Jackie, he got on the train, uh, and he started shouting, you've been missing something here. I've been calling your name, and you wasn't even. And uh, he, uh, uh, he just, uh, uh, he got beside himself because he realized what God meant to him. Let me show it to you. And you've seen this. You've read this. But notice what he said in verse number 12 of the first chapter of Timothy as he sends this letter to the young preacher boy. Uh, the young preacher boy. Uh, he's thankful for what the Lord's done for him. Look at verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord uh, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful asking my mama to put me into the ministry. That's the way you could read that in a lot of these little John Doe's and Jack Frost and all these. Uh, he knew why he was in the ministry. He said, God counted me faithful. Look at this. 
putting me into the ministry. He knew he had a divine call upon his life. Man, I remember when I felt the call of God on my life. There's nothing like, outside of, look, I think three of the greatest things that can ever happen to anybody, first of all, the greatest thing that can happen to you is to get saved. The second greatest thing can happen to you is to have the assurance that you are saved. And then to those of us in the ministry, the third greatest thing that can ever happen to us is to know that we have been put into the ministry by none other than the one who saved us and gave, gave us the assurance of our salvation. And he said, I'm grateful, I'm thankful to the Lord for what he's done for me. And then he reminds them, I reminds Timothy, he never got over this himself, he reminds him of who he used to be Oh, it's good every now and then to remember where he dug us up from. And that's what Paul's saying to Timothy. He said, who was before? Now look at this. Here's he, he said, this is what I used to be. Aren't you glad if you're saved tonight, you can talk in those tenses? Aren't you glad you can say, this is what I used to be, but no longer. This is where I used to live, but no more. I moved across the tracks. I, I got up in a different part of the town because God exalted me. God saved me, not what I used to be. And by the way, we're not yet what we're going to be. Now look in verse number three. He said, was before a blasphemer. He said, I was a persecutor, injurious. Uh, that word injurious there is a word that we get our word bully from. He bullied the church. Uh, he, uh, he, he put them to death and uh, he was on his way down the road uh, uh, to arrest Christians and put them in prison. He stood by when Stephen was stoned to death. He said, I was a bully. I was injurious. But look at this. But I obtained mercy. Man, good night. That's enough right there. Uh, well, I won't say what I say. But uh, he said, I obtained mercy. Notice this. Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You know what the problem of the world is today? They're ignorant. You know why they're ignorant? Because they're living in unbelief. Listen, there's a vast difference in being on the inside looking out and on the outside looking in. I'm glad tonight to report that some of us in this building say we're on the inside looking out. And let me tell you, it looks a vastly different when your sins have been forgiven and you can talk about what God's done for you uh, on the inside looking at And Paul said, here's what I used to be. But look at verse number 13. He said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Uh, but I want you to notice two words here. And all of us in here tonight are recipients of these two words. I've got them circled in my Bible and a line drawn to these two words. Notice with me in verse number 13. He said, I obtained, here's the first word, mercy. Oh, I hear people say, I want justice. Man, I don't want justice. Jesus took our justice. I mean, uh, he, uh, he paid our debt. Uh, if, if, if it hadn't been for his mercy, we'd be on our way to hell this evening. But notice in verse number 14, the third word's grace. I'm glad that the, those are twins. Mercy and grace. And notice what he said. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. Now, look at that. If that don't help you, uh, I'm not sure a big watermelon would make you help, feel any better than this. I want you to notice this. Notice what he said. He didn't say what I got was just abundant. He said it was exceedingly abundant. That means to throw beyond. That means to go beyond. That means that not only is the river flowing, but the river is out of its banks. And the river is out in the bottom. Uh, that means that not only did you get uh, a big cup of ice cream, but you got a big cherry on top of it and some of those nuts around and some of that, I better hold on right there, I'll lose half of you. But notice what he said. He said, I got something over and beyond the normal. Now these uh, other fake religions, they can't even give you the normal. But we not only got the normal, we got that which was exceedingly, exceedingly abundant. 
with faith and love, and here's the source of it, in Christ Jesus. And now in verse number 15, he's talked about his past, he's talked about what's happened to him, but now in verse number 15, he said, I want you to know that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He said, now wait a minute, he took us back. He said, here's what I used to do. But he said, God had grace and God had mercy on me. Uh, and he said, because God had grace and mercy on me. God had grace, uh, hallelujah. He had grace uh, and he had mercy on me. Uh, and as a result of that, I want you to know what he said, uh, that he forgive me, he came into this world to save sinners. Now look, look. Look, we, we do a lot of things. I, nothing wrong with doing things. Uh, but we must never get caught up into thinking uh, that the emphasis ar around here and in our personal lives and in this church uh, is, is majoring on anything other than the focus to try to keep people out of hell. That's what he said here. Notice what he said. He, he taught us in verse number 15 why Jesus came into the world. Notice what he said. He came into the world, look at this, to save sinners. That was the purpose of his coming. That was the reason he stepped out of glory and stepped down here to save us and to save the world. Next time somebody puts a question mark around why Jesus come, right here it is. Give them this verse of scripture. And the next time you run into somebody and they say, I'm too bad to be saved, you tell them that the worst one has already been saved. And if God can save the worst, he can save anybody else. Because Paul said in verse number 15, he said, I am the chief sinner. He said, nobody has ever done more wrong than I did. Nobody has ever persecuted the name of Christ more than I did. Nobody has ever uh, tried to persecute the church and stamp out the way of Christianity more than I did. But he said God had mercy and God had grace on me uh, and he said he saved me the chiefest of sinners to let Timothy know that wherever he goes over to church of Ephesus where we believe he was a pastor when he goes over there and runs into some of that crowd from the temple of Diana who are worshiping so called God. Uh, God's that's fallen out of the universe, uh, uh, he can say, wait a minute, I want you to understand something. It doesn't matter what you've been worshiping. Uh, you can worship the true and the living God, uh, and you're not so far removed from salvation uh, that you can't be saved because the apostle Paul got saved. Look at what he did, and God forgave him. He calls himself the chiefest of sinners. So as we walk out of this building this evening and we go back to our homes, respective places, go to the businesses tomorrow, go to the job tomorrow, go to the marketplace tomorrow, wherever we go, uh, we can know that the worst one has been saved uh, as a pattern to say to us, nobody is beyond being saved unless they choose to be so. Amen. Now, when Paul got over it, when Paul got to think about getting saved, he couldn't get over it. So you know what he did? He hooked up on that train. Wake up. He hooked up on he hooked up on the train. He hooked up on the train. Look at verse how be for this cause I obtain mercy. That in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now he built the steam up on the train on this next verse. You know what he did? He just stopped and shouted a while. He got to thinking about where he came from. He got to thinking about what God's done for him. He got to thinking about how wonderful Jesus uh, was in his life. And so he just stopped and praised him for a while. You ever do that? <clears throat> you ever get to thinking about what it means to be saved? You ever get to, has it ever dawned on you where we could be? You ever stop and think about that? I do. In the earlier years of my life, I came across some very dangerous experiences. I could have been thrown into eternity lost. Man, I remember going down Highway 601 from Yadkinville to Courtney where I lived with a friend of mine in high school over in Yadkin County driving a 59 Chevrolet 
with three deuces. Now, some of you will know what I'm talking about. When you push the accelerator down, honestly, when you push, push the accelerator down, the hood would suck down like that. And you're talking about something that would run. I remember coming down Highway 109, uh, excuse me, one, uh, uh, 601, between uh, Yadkinville and Courtney, and uh, he, I looked over at the speedometer, and it was out of sight on the right. It had gone down as far as it could go. I don't know what we were doing. And the, and the fence bows looked like toothpicks. And we'd hit a bump here, and it'd come way down over there. And a little air could have got under that thing, and we'd been gone. We'd been history. I remember being on two tractors at two different times that turned over while I was on the tractor. I remember my parents telling me when I was a kid, small, small kid, uh, had me in a side room of our old big two-story house. And they heard something, and somebody was trying to break in, and word got out that I had been kidnapped. Somebody was trying to kidnap me. And it, it was even announced on the radio station that I had been kidnapped and killed. By the way, somebody called here the other day and said, we heard that the pastor of Berean Baptist Church was dead and had his funeral. I was really surprised. I, you know, you want to reach around and paint yourself and... and uh, and uh, I kind of pinched myself. And the secretary said, I don't think that's so. I just handed him a paper about three minutes ago. <laughs> and that was the understatement. Uh, that would have, have been something. I mean, that takes the breath plumb out of you. Now, look at verse number 17. He, he just stops and shouts a while. Notice what he calls it, our Savior. Here's one of that name I'm talking to us about tonight. Now unto the king. <laughs> Jesus is king. I said Jesus is king. He's always been king. Do you know back in eternity he was king? If you read the 38th chapter of the book of Job, the Bible says that when he created, and John 1 and the book of Colossians tells us, that all things were created by him. When he created, the Bible says in the book of Job, chapter number 38, that the morning stars sang together. Why did they do that? They looked at the mighty power of our king. And when our king was creating and speaking worlds and suns and moon and star, stars into existence, the angels had already been created before creation itself. And while the Lord is speaking all of this into existence, uh, the Bible says that the morning stars sang together. They were overthrown uh, in their thinking capacity that, uh, that a king like Jesus uh, could be such a marvelous king, such a great king, that he had so much power that he could create so many things. Uh, in the book of Matthew, the Bible says, at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the word was, where is he uh, that is born king of the Jews? Uh, that little flesh and blood laying there and cradled in Mary's arms uh, there in Bethlehem of Judea. My friend, he was the God man. But I want you to notice, uh, the Bible is very clear that even on the day of his birth, uh, he was called the king. And now Paul is thinking about the one that saved him. And he said, this, this can't be just an ordinary person. In order to be saved, it's going to take the king to take care of all the transactions of my salvation. And so he just starts praising the Lord. Now unto the king. And notice his king. Notice our king. He is eternal and he's immortal and he's invisible and he's the only wise God. And, and be honor and glory for Ever and ever. Amen. Now, how long is our king going to live? Right here it is. He's going to live forever and forever. And Paul said, I get to thinking about it. The only thing I know to add to it is an amen. Now, uh, how long is our king going to live? He's going to live forever. And what should we say? Amen. amen. And because we're saved, we're going to live forever with him. Amen. amen. And Paul said, hey, thank God for that. That brings us back to the sixth chapter. Uh, he said in verse number 14 of chapter 6, he said, the glorious manifestation uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he was looking for the return of his king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And while he's thinking about that, uh, he said, which in his times he shall show. Now, wait a minute. 
uh, I was uh, listening to uh, Fox News, I think it was, or I was on the internet, and I happened to see uh, a prophecy that somebody had made that some probably this week, I believe uh, it's supposed to be this week, maybe it's last week, it's either last week or this week, uh, they said that uh, the world was going to end, it's going to be over with, and they've got this inside information that it's, that it's about over. I remember back in 1988, a man wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come in 1988. He might as well have written 88 Reasons Why the Lord Will Not Come in 1988 because the Lord is not functioning according to our timetable uh, and according to our calendar and our date book. Uh, and Paul says that same thing right here in this verse of Scripture when he said, which in his times, not our times, which in his times, he's going to show something. He's going to show he who is the blessed and only potentate. One of these days, you can just take all of the gods that, that's ever lived and all of the idols and line them up beside Jesus Christ, and you're going to find out something. There was only one that was substantial. You remember when they stole that false god back in the Old Testament and set it up beside of a building, and through the night it fell over? Who in the world would want to follow an anemic God like that? Our God was put under, but he came up. And Paul said, in time, he's going to show who is the only potentate. He's the Pope. Not the Romish Pope. By the way, they talk about the immortality of the Pope of Rome. I find that to be very interesting because they've been replacing them for years. And it's amazing how they replace them when their pope dies. They get a bunch of cardinals together who probably never carved a thing. They, put, they get this bunch of cardinals together and they decide who's going to be the next pope. And they've got a stove in the room. And when they decide who's going to replace their infallible head, who they found wasn't infallible, and they get, a, a, they get a pope to replace him. They build a fire in the stove, and the chimney's up there at Vatican Square, and when they see the smoke come out the top of the chimney, all of the thousands of people standing around there in, uh, in Rome, they begin to rejoice. We've got us another infallible head. How fake is that? They've been replacing their infallible heads for years and years and years, and their infallible heads in the sight of God are not infallible. They are human beings, and they say that when the Pope speaks, he speaks the very oracles of God, and if he wants to uh, speak new scriptures and new words from whatever he says, uh, it may substitute, the, of course, they don't have the Bible, they've got a a bunch of junk over there. They've got their own version and they've taken this out and added that in. And you won't, in your Bible, you won't find a, a purgatory, but they've got one in their Bible because they want that. They've used that to make money for the Catholic Church uh, because they think they can pray people out. Uh, the Mormon Church thinks they, they can baptize them out. The Mormon Church baptizes by proxy. If you've got a family member that uh, went to hell, uh, you can get him out by being baptized on his behalf. And you're, you go under the water by proxy. That brings your loved one or someone uh, out of the pit of hell. <laughs> Look, P notice how many millions uh, Mormons uh, there are in the world. Notice how many million Catholics there are in the world. You know what that means? They're lost. You know why? 
You, you don't get saved. You know this. I, I'm just reminding it of it, although we once knew that. We don't get saved uh, because we go down to the baptistry, and we don't get saved because we have to go to purgatory and get our sins uh, purged. Uh, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that purges our sins. Uh, and all this other stuff is false religion. That's all in the world it is. And Paul said, I'm going to praise God that I have a potentate. Now, the word potentate there means all-powerful. It means all-powerful. All of these other, other guys, they're just like us. Uh, they, they are mortal human beings, stooped in Adam's sin. And the word potentate there is, one of the, is, is the same word that we use in Romans chapter 1 where Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The word potentate there and the word power in Romans 1, 16, identical words. Uh, the gospel is the power of God. Jesus is the potentate. He is the power. There's no other religious leader in the world, never has been, never will be, that has in him the possession of all power and all authority. But all power resides in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the potentate. He's not a potentate. He is the potentate. But not only is he the potentate, but notice this. Here's what we're talking about tonight. I could have preached about any of these names here tonight. He just got so many names. But notice this. Not only is he the potentate, but he's the king of all kings. Now, there's been there are nations in, in England and all these other places around the world. Uh, they have their thrones. And, uh, of course, over in England, all of that is a figurehead. It's all it is. The king and the queen over or the queen over in England, they don't really have any power. They're sitting there in the royalty and got their chauffeurs riding them around and the Rolls Royces and they've got waiters and they're, they're living uh, in, in royalty uh, uh, and uh, they talk about the queen and she's on up in her 90s now and uh, she wears uh, 10 uh, uh, pearls around her neck. Uh, tens of thousands of dollars in value and, and shoes that cost thousands of dollars and outfit that cost, outfits that cost thousands and thousands of dollars uh, and uh, they live there in complete royalty but ever now and then the queen dies or the king dies. Uh, why? They're mortal. They don't live forever. They may live in the luxury of this world but if they're lost that's all they've ever got. Uh, but the good news is we can live in poverty here and be saved uh, and my friend the best is still ahead for us. Uh, heaven is in view tonight for the child of God. Uh, we're not going forward to get lost Yes, we're going forward to get more because we have a king tonight and he's not just a king he's the king of all kings uh, I remember years ago they uh, 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 untuned uh, one of the one of the kings uh, and uh, they set him on a throne uh, and he had an open copy of the Bible on his lap uh, and they sealed up that thing and set him in there on a royal throne uh, and uh, several years later, they decided to go in and exhume him, and they opened up that tomb, uh, and the, all of the flesh on his body had decayed, uh, and the crown had fallen down uh, uh, over his nose, uh, and the little bony finger uh, had fallen on a verse of Scripture in the Gospel of Mark, uh, where it says, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world uh, and lose his own soul? Uh, look, my friend, the, the kings of this earth, they don't have power beyond the grave uh, and even their power on the side of the grave is limited. Uh, oh but thank God I serve a king tonight whose power is not limited on this side of the grave and his power is not limited on the other side of the grave. Uh, he is the king of all kings. He is the king supreme. Uh, he is the king with all power. He is our potentate but then there are people in the world and government uh, uh, institutions that are called lords uh, but notice what it said about that just in case somebody gets big head uh, and they say well we've got king, a king here that heads up our country and we've got lords below him uh, Paul said I want you to understand and by the way they had that in the day when Paul was writing uh, this letter
letter. And so it's really a takeoff against the Roman Empire. Uh, Paul said they think they've got power. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you who the potentate is. Let me tell you who the king of kings is. Uh, let me tell you where all power resides. Uh, and to those people who say they're lords and they're over people, let me talk to you about one who is the Lord of lords. He is the Lord over all lords, uh, king of kings, and the only potentate. My friend, I want you to understand something tonight. He got to thinking about the coming of the Lord in the previous verse. He just had to stop like he did in chapter number one and just praise God and have a spell for a while. Amen. No, no, it's what he said, Lord of lords, who only, I love this one, who only hath immortality. Now what in the world does that mean? He is a potentate, he's the king of kings, he's the lord of lords, and he has immortality. What does that word mean? I'm so glad you ask. It means not subject to death. Not subject to death. Who is our savior? He's the potentate, he's the king of kings, he's the lord of lords, and he is immortal in that he is not subject to death. You say, well, he died. He died voluntarily. Don't ever let somebody convince you that they took the life of Jesus when he died on Calvary. Nobody took his life. That's what he said in the 10th chapter of John. He said, nobody takes my life from me. He said, I have power to lay it down. And he said, I have power to take it again. And the only way death could put the stranglehold on him was for Jesus Christ to walk up to death and say, go ahead, death, I'll take Ron Beatty's place. Put your name there. Jesus said, go ahead, death, I'll die for him, I'll die for her. I will submit to death, but death, I want you to know, I want you to fully understand, you're just going to have a limited possession of me because I will be out in just a few hours. And thank God on the first day he got out of there to let us know that he is, in fact, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Uh, and there is, there is immortality that dwells within him. And the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter number 7, uh, uh, over and over again in the book of Romans chapter number 8, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, hallelujah, uh, resides in an endless life uh, and that we are married to him and this marriage will end only when he dies and since he lives in the power of endless life, don't you believe it when uh, they say preacher beat is dead? Don't you believe it when somebody calls the office and said, I heard you just buried your... Don't you believe that? D.L. Moody said, you're going to read in the paper one day that I've died. He said, don't you believe a word of it? He said, at that moment, I will be more alive than I have ever been before. Why? We've got a king that's immortal. We've got a king not subject to death. He will never have to die again. He will never have to go to Calvary again because by one offering he has perfected forever those that believe. He's immortal. That's our Savior. That's our Savior. When our Savior got up in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse number 3 as the king, the Bible said, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Why did he sit down there? He sat down there as our king. The king is the one that sits on the throne. And Jesus sat on the throne. But I want you to listen to what he said. When he had by himself purged our sins. This crowd today that believes they've got to do something to help get their sins forgiven, my friend Jesus doesn't need any help. He needs no help. The Bible said when he had by himself purged our sins. Uh, look, if Jesus Christ can't do it, it won't get done. But I've got good news for us tonight. Those of us that are saved, we know it's already happened. Look, if you're saved, salvation is in three tenths. We have been saved. We are being saved. We shall be saved. 
We've been saved from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from the power of sin. And one of these days, by God's grace, we're going to be saved from the very presence of sin because we've got a king who sat down on the right hand of the Father. And in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, you ought to read this this week when you're doing your Bible study. You ought to read the first chapter of the book of Ephesians uh, because the Bible said that Jesus was raised from the dead uh, and he was set as our king at the Father's right hand, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion uh, and every name that is named in this world uh, and every name that's named in the world to come and he's been given to be the head over all things to the church. Uh, what a savior we possess tonight. There's nothing tonight uh, that, he, that, that he's subject to but everything is subject to him. There is nothing tonight that he can't do. There is nothing tonight uh, that he can't perform. There's no deed that he cannot do because he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn to the 11th chapter in closing of the last book of the Bible. That's not indexed. The book of the Revelation. In the book of the Revelation, the 11th chapter, the two witnesses are preaching in the streets of Jerusalem. The seventh trumpet is sounding. And I want you to notice with me in verse number 15 of Revelation chapter 11. The Bible said, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Look at this. And he shall reign forever and ever. Who is it that reigns? It's a king that reigns. He's got a kingdom. How long is his kingdom going to last? The Bible says it will last forever. And he didn't just say it's going to last forever. He wants the emphasis put on it. The king that we serve is going to have a kingdom. And all of the other kingdoms of the world are going to acknowledge that there's only one worthy to be the king. There's only one that has the power to be king. There's only one that has the authority to be king. There's only one whose domain is an everlasting domain. There's only one who's king of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, there's only one who's going to reign forever and forever and forever. By the way, his name is King Jesus. Amen. And amen. I'm grateful tonight for my king. The kingdoms of this world are begun, going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and forever. Well, I was just getting started, but it's time to stop. I could just stay here all night and talk about the king. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad for the king? Aren't you glad to be a part of the king? Aren't you glad to be a part of his dominion? Amen and amen. What a king we serve, King Jesus tonight. Oh, I'm so glad. Some of these days we're going to bow in his presence. We're going to bow before his throne and before his authority. And we're going to weep, I'm sure, because those tears are not wiped away until after the white throne judgment. I believe we're going to be there and weeping in happiness. We're going to look on him and we're going to see where he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Uh, and we're going to see the marks of the slaughter on our blessed king's body. And we're going to see the love in his eyes and his countenance uh, that's going to speak 10 million words to us in a split second. Uh, and I believe the first thing we're going to do is fall on our face in his presence. Uh, and we're just going to say, thank you, Jesus. Uh, praise your name uh, that you loved us the way you loved us and brought us to such a place as this. Uh, I remember when my first wife got killed uh, in, in car wreck. And we wanted to get away that year and go to Florida. And I'd heard about Cypress Gardens. We decided we'd go through Cypress Gardens at Christmas time. We got in a little old uh, boat. They took us around. 
good night. You'd think you'd died and gone to heaven. I've never seen such beauty in my life. The trees was in bloom and the flowers was in bloom. Uh, and it looked like a paradise when we got down there. And about halfway through that thing, I got to thinking, man, this is no more than a briar patch compared to what we're heading for on the other side of glory. I, hey, I want you to understand. Uh, look, look, he, he, he created the world and the universe and in six days, he's been going away for 2,000 years working. What do you think? Is, by the way, you know what he was down here? He was a carpenter. He built furniture. He, he was raised in the house of Joseph, who was a carpenter. He learned to take his hands and build chairs and, and probably beds and, and tables and end tables uh, because he was a carpenter. But my friend, not only was he a carpenter down here, but he's gone away to be a carpenter over there. You say, how do you know that? Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, listen to this, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And Peter said that we have a reserve, a preserved place in glory while we're being reserved down here for glory. Oh, listen, I want you to understand tonight, if he could do this in, in six days down here, what do you think 2,000 plus years is going to be like up there? You won't have to put sunglasses on. You're going to have a glorified body. When you get over there, amen. You talking about a time? We're going to have a time. You'll have to have a glorified body because if some of you didn't have a glorified body, you'd have to have value. It'd be such a shock to you, you couldn't handle it. Yeah, yeah, he's the king. He's the king. Thank God for King Jesus. Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Lord, I want to thank you tonight. You're our king. I want to thank you tonight that all power resides in you. And Lord, your presence has been so wonderful tonight. I want to thank you for what my own heart's felt. Thank you that in our weakness we can experience your strength. Thank you, dear Lord, that you can make yourself known to us because of who you are and what you're capable of doing. I pray this evening if there's a need in this auditorium that needs to be met, help your folks to access the power and the presence that's available from the one in whom all power resides. And I'll thank you for it. Because I ask in Jesus' name, if you need to come tonight, if there's a need in your life, well, the Clayton's going to lead us. Step out and come if you need to pray and talk to the Lord about something. Stands if anybody else needs to come, would you come? Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies? Mercies for
Jesus is called.